Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Hey everybody, I just wanted to give a quick little editorial note up front that there were a lot of audio glitches in the recording of this episode, so if you notice that the quality is a little choppier and a little rougher at times than usual, that's why. I did my best to clean it up, but there's only so much I can do. Blame Skype for messing with their API. lot less notes for the introduction of this one. Yeah. And I got the entire synopsis down in one paragraph. Nice. Yeah, I'm not much to it. Yeah. So I'm ready to start whenever you guys are. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Masters of Carpentry, a John Carpenter fan podcast. I am Alex. Directly across from me is Julia. Hi. And in sunny Minnesota is... Noel. Hi. <laughs> How are you doing, Noel? I'm doing fine. You two doing good? We're doing good. Aces. Are you ready to master some more carpentry? Always. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I gotta be careful not to make that a catchphrase. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think it's too late. I think it is a catchphrase. It's like the uh, Mortal Kombat animated series where they're like, it's combat time. <laughs> well, if it was, it probably was combat time. It's true. They were ready to fight. <laughs> Although I, I, I don't know why I don't want to ready, fight. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> ready, ready, fight. fight. <laughs> Very to the point. Well, it was a kid's cartoon, so they couldn't use finish him. Yeah. That's true, yeah. Kill him in front of your parents. <laughs> Though surprisingly, the Highlander cartoon still had decapitation. It did not. Really? It didn't show it. It would always happen off screen. With like a splash of blood on the main character's face. <laughs> like the sword would swing down, lights, that's about it. That's amazing. I need to see that. But this isn't the Russell Mulcahy podcast. Not yet, anyways. <laughs> we'll change it. <laughs> true. Food for thought for follow-up. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So what do we got in the docket today? What's our film down the pipeline? Today we're talking about the 1978 film Eyes of Laura Mars. Before we actually talk about the film itself, I think we need to talk about Giallo. Giallo was, of course, the Italian horror movement that gave rise to the slasher film. Giallo is the Italian word for yellow, which was named after the cover of Italian pulp thrillers. A lot of the uh, Giallo films, which started up in the 60s under Mario Bava, with titles such as Girl Who Knew Too Much and Blood and Black Lace, were inspired by Hitchcock and featured very highly stylized glamour and fashion mixed with highly stylized violence. And in the early 70s, this kind of became cemented as a subgenre on its own when Dario Argento came up in the 70s, debuting with the film Bird with the Crystal Plumage and followed by Cat O' Nine Tales, Four Flies on Grey Velvet, and Deep Red. Now, have either of you guys seen any Dario Argento movies? Only? Suspiria. Suspiria. That is it. I am among those who is not a fan of Suspiria. Yeah? I enjoy it, but it's not one I would go to bat for. Like, I thought it was pretty cool, but it really doesn't have a special place in my heart at all. <laughs> it's very kind of removed, very stylized. I liked some of the imagery in it, but it really doesn't do too much for me. Julia? I remember liking it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Not enough to remember it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Argento, he does have a unique style. He does have a lot of mood and atmosphere. But my main problem with him is that he has this philosophy that he doesn't care about story and character because he wants to focus on mood and tension. And I'm like, those two are not mutually exclusive. Hmm. You can have story and character and mood and tension. And so his films kind of become a series of throwing random shit at the audience. Fair enough. I'm not just basing this on Suspiria. I also saw back in the day, I saw Deep Red, I saw Inferno, Opera, Tenebrae, Phenomenon. So I, I did see a good handful of his movies. And leading up to this podcast, I wanted to go back and watch the early stuff, uh, Bird with Crystal Plumage and Cat of Nine Tales. And I wanted to just say uh, Bird with the Crystal Plumage, so-so. It's got some neat ideas, but it's a little dry, a little hammy. Cat of Nine Tales, on the other hand, is an absolutely fantastic thriller. It actually has really good characters, a really intelligent storyline, and all the slick atmosphere and tension. Marvelous film. I highly recommend it. And, of course, it's no surprise that I love it, and Dario Argento considers it among one of his weakest movies. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I bring this up because John Carpenter was a fan of Dario Argento and especially the stuff that he was doing in the early 70s. And a lot of stuff that we'll see in Halloween and especially in this film come out of a lot of those early movements like Cat of Nine Tales. Every single kill is done from the killer's first person point of view. Uh, of course, yeah. You know, it's that mixture of the victim trying to solve the mystery while also working with the cop who's trying to solve the mystery, the big twist ending, the use of fashion and glamour and raising questions of what violence means while also showing violence. Bird with Crystal Plumage and Cat of Nine Tails are very much a predecessor for what we see here in Eyes of Laura Mars, or at least what Carpenter intended us to see here in Eyes of Laura Mars. And I also want to mention Blood and Black Lace, the Mario Bava film, which is about fashion models at a fashion runway show being gradually picked off by a killer in a black trench coat. And again, very similar, a lot of similarities in terms of plot, a lot of similarities in terms of setup and execution. Anyone who's seen Eyes of Laura Mars, I, I would recommend you go check out some of the early Giallo movies and let us know what you think about them in the comments, because we haven't gotten any comments yet. Yeah, we need some comments. We <laughs> thrive on comments and we're starving, folks. Come on. So now I think we should go into the film itself. After the production of Dark Star, John Carpenter wrote a 10-page treatment called Eyes that he uh, handed over to Jack H. Harris, who was the producer of The Blob, who came in and helped fund the last remaining shoot on Dark Star. And during a meeting that Harris had with a producer named John Peters, Peters saw the treatment on Jack's desk, gave it a read, then instantly bought the property and hired Carpenter to write a full draft. Now, John Peters is an interesting guy. Have either of you seen Kevin Smith has those DVDs that are out, which where it's basically just him giving speaking engagements at colleges and stuff? Oh, yes, absolutely. We've seen uh, two or three of them. Yeah, he has that story about his time when he was working on Superman Lives. Yep. And this crazy eccentric nutball producer who was the one who you have to put a giant spider in the third act. Of course, yes. Classic story. That's John Peters. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> So back in 1974, John Peters owned and operated his own hair salon on Rodeo Drive, which was frequented by a lot of the Hollywood starlets of the time, one of whom was Barbara Streisand, with whom he fell into a relationship, even though he was still married at the time, and then became her overall business manager. This is starting to fall into place. Starting with the 1976 film A Star is Born, Peters moved into being a producer and did a lot of really interesting and odd films from the 70s and 80s. He did Caddyshack. He did a number of other stuff. In the 80s, he kind of inherited the DC properties for a while, hmm. and he produced Batman, the Tim Burton one. And it was under him that in the 90s, the Batman films kind of became what they did, that Watchmen kind of bounced around, and one of his last actual involvements was producing the Catwoman movie. Good job there. <laughs> so it's kind of because him that a lot of the DC movies took a while to get off the ground. And even to this day, he still kind of is wrangled up in that and why some of them are still having a hard time getting made. But anyways, with Eyes of Laura Mars, Barbara Streisand was actually in talks to star in it, but she thought it was too violent, yet she still provided the uh, opening and closing theme song that we hear in the movie. That's what I was going to say. Eyes of Laura Mars, a.k.a. Prisoner. Which, what do you guys think of the song? I would not have thought that was a Barbara Streisand song at first. It was very, like, psychedelic rockish, but overall, I kind of liked it. You were still singing it about an hour after we watched it. So yeah. I think you might have liked it. Adding my own lyrics. Yeah. <laughs> It's a fun song. It's a very 70s kind of pop ballad song, but it's good. Yeah. It's just kind of odd to, you know, be watching this movie and then it's Pavra. Yes, I know. It was very strange to hear that. So anyways, back to the production history. I do still have a few more notes here. Irvin Kirshner was first offered the director's chair, but he didn't like the script and turned it down. Then Michael Miller, the director of Street Girls and Jackson County Jail, which also starred Tommy Lee Jones, briefly took over, but then he left and Kirshner came back. The script was rewritten by David Zellig Goodman, who was kind of a big writer there for a few years. He did Love and Other Strangers, Monty Walsh, Man on a Swing, Logan's Run. His most prominent credit is probably Straw Dogs, but that was kind of rewritten by Sam Peckinpah, so don't really know how much of that's credit to who. <laughs> it's violent, so I would say Sam Peckinpah. <laughs> yeah. Goodman ended up having some health issues and couldn't keep working on the film, so Julian Barry came on board. He's a playwright who's probably best known for writing both the play and the film Lenny, the story of Lenny Bruce, which is a very good movie and I highly recommend it. I also recommend it. Now, I did find a script, a draft of the screenplay for this film. It is pretty much the final draft by Goodman and Barry. There's no real major differences, just some chunks here and there that were cut out, and I'll kind of point those out as we go through the discussion. 
Sounds good. As a director, Irvin Kirshner is someone who I've always had a bit of a hard time to pin down because he's largely a, a for hire guy who's brought into existing properties instead of like kind of going out and building his own projects. But everything I've seen of him, it's, it's very competent and intelligent work. I mean, I've seen this Empire Strikes Back right on NTAB and Never Say Never Again. I don't really see like a stylistic stamp that he puts on his movies, though, because yeah. I was thinking about Empire Strikes Back, which is pretty much my favorite movie of all time, while watching this. And there is no similarities. I could not say one way or the other that that is the same director. Yeah, I'll agree with that. I, I have other thoughts about him as a director, but I think I'll save those for when we get into discussing the movie. Of course. Because I actually didn't realize a lot of them until I saw this movie. Just a couple of other notable names. We have Michael Kahn, the editor of the film. The year before this, he edited Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and from then on has edited every single Steven Spielberg film up to today. It's a good job. So this was cut by Spielberg's editor. Nice. And Artie Kane, the composer, was also the composer of all the music on The Love Boat and Wonder Woman. <laughs> nice. And the actual photographs that were used in the film were shot by Helmut Newton and Rebecca Blake. To this day, Blake continues to be a popular fashion photographer, and Newton at the time was noted for very provocative and highly charged pictures that often tied together themes of sex and violence. So he also was kind of a consultant in terms of a lot of the uh, philosophy in terms of that angle. All right. And he passed away in 2004. So anything else we need to bring up before I go into the very quick synopsis? Not really. We went into this not knowing a single thing about this movie, so we really don't have anything to add at the beginning. Ditto. I mean, this film has kind of become this little hidden nugget. Not a lot of people know about it, and even those who do don't talk about it all that much. I did not know about it. I was not interested in watching it, and I will let you know our thoughts very shortly. <laughs> Same here. I think I kind of know some of the reasons why, but we'll get into it. To promote her new book, The Eyes of Laura Mars, fashion photographer Laura and her friends open a gallery exhibition of her work, which is widely talked about and controversial for how it uses highly sexualized and violent images to sell basic home products. When a killer starts taking her friends and colleagues out with an ice pick, Laura finds herself locked in sudden psychic visions as her sight is temporarily replaced by the point of view of the killer, forcing her to witness each crime from his point of view. As the number of suspects start to build, the abusive boyfriend of one of her models, her bitter punk of a limo driver, her boozed-up ex-husband, Laura finds herself falling in love with John Neville, the lead detective of the case. In the end, it's revealed that Neville himself is the killer, and that their linked hearts and minds inspired both his violence and her art. Or at least I think that's what happened. It's a yeah. little... Yeah. Torn between sides that want to both kill her and love her, Neville forces Laura to gun him down. And that's it. That's pretty much it, yep. So do you guys recommend this movie? I do. I was very surprised. I was very pleasantly surprised by this movie. I thought it was a really neat little thriller from the 70s. I assumed it was just going to be like a run-of-the-mill 70s like a seven ups, like a Roy Scheider movie, basically, that I would just forget about and be bored all the way through. But I was very pleasantly surprised. Julia? Well, pretty much. Well, you said it's everyone. I would assume it's everyone. Every time we were like, okay, let's watch this movie. And we sit down the first 30 seconds. We're like, I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> and I actually wrote on the top of my page, I hate it. <laughs> and I would say it took about another 30 seconds before I was like, oh, okay, well, that's not so bad. Okay. And then five minutes in, I was like, oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> I would definitely recommend it. I loved it. No, how about you? I recommend the film too. My only caveats are I think it is a little bland. It's not bad. I think it's actually very well shot, very well cut. The cast is wonderful. It looks great. The story is interesting and captivating, but I think it has a few main problems. And my two main problems are Laura Mars herself is a very inactive protagonist. She's just someone who kind of everything happens to her and she does very little to drive her own story. And the other is that the themes of violence and all that whatnot kind of fall out of the picture as it goes on. And I think part of that is because the actual kills themselves are really kind of tame and don't actually really carry on that theme. And so it ends up being a good, perfectly watchable and entertaining thriller that still isn't quite what it could be. I would agree with that. So why don't we go ahead and move into open discussion? What do you guys think about what I said about Laura Mars herself? No, I would agree with that. She basically is falling apart the entire time. She kind of just watches through the eyes of the killer, kind of gets a headache and just falls apart, basically. She doesn't really try to solve the killings. She's just really bummed out by it the entire time. Well, I don't think it's her job to solve the killings. Like, what is she, like, going to go out in her sleuth outfit? 
She's not that type of woman. I don't think that's necessarily a bad writing choice. She's totally dressed like Sherlock Holmes. At one point she is, and she does talk about clues. Yes. It's not so much that I want her to investigate as I wish she would at least take some action. It felt like all she was there to do was to bear witness and be a victim. To the point where I don't even know what the point of the psychic connection was because it didn't really affect much of the outcome of the movie. The psychic outcome was very interesting because they don't really explain it at all, which I did appreciate because any explanation they gave us would probably be very silly. But yeah, I think it is why she is not a great protagonist because she's incapacitated whenever it comes on. She can't really see anything except for what the killer is doing, although she seems to be able to drive her car pretty well. But the information that she gets from them don't really service the story in any way in that she doesn't prevent any crimes. She can't see who the killer is. She always gets there right after the police have already arrived. That's because she's seeing it in real time. I know. She's trying to get there in time, but she's never going to make it because it's happening as she's seeing. Mm -hmm. But my problem is I can understand that in terms of being a narrative device, but as a narrative device, I don't think it's making for a very compelling story. I think they could have trimmed it down. I think it could have been like a really good episode of The Twilight Zone where they used it and showed it like the killer getting closer to him until she saw her own face in the killer's eyes and knew that that was the killer. I thought that would have been. And it kind of does pay off in that regard, but not as wonderful as I would have liked it. Because at that point, I'm like, there are no suspects left by the time they actually reveal who the killer is. I'm like, it has to be this person. Well, now here's a question. When the ex-husband was killed in the elevator... Did you realize it was him, or did you fall for the psych out and think it was Neville getting killed? No, I thought it was him. I don't even know if I would have thought it was him, because when I was going through the list of suspects when we were watching it, I didn't think of uh, Tommy Lee Jones. It was Alex, who's watched a lot more <laughs> <laughs> horror movies and thrillers and stuff like that. It was like, no, well, probably Tommy Lee Jones. And I'm like, what? And then at the elevator, even when he was covering his face, he just saw his hair. I'm like, could go either way, could go either way. And he's like, no, it's Tommy Lee Jones. <laughs> yeah, it's what I call the law of plots. I'll go into it one time, but I've seen way too many movies, and I'm very annoying to watch movies with, by the way, because I'm just like, by process of elimination, it's this gentleman. <laughs> also, my big tip-off was when the two models are killed, they knew who it was, and they didn't know who Raul Julia was. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So they could have known, because it was her ex-husband. Oh, I guess that's true. Yeah, I mean, obviously their faces, when you look at them, was like, hey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, they were more interested in, like, being happy instead of, like, what are you doing here, random person I haven't seen in a long time? But, no, they probably wouldn't know who that guy Yeah, well, they had a scene with the detective just before where yeah. they were being flirtatious with each other yeah. and uh, playful, so I just assumed by that point. But I guess, yeah, it could have been Raul Julia at the same time. Mm -hmm. One of the things that was interesting was when he's pulling out the crime scene photos and putting them side by side with her photos and saying that, you know, these were crimes that happened 14 months ago. It's an interesting bit of backstory of saying that, okay, he was killing back then and she was already tapping into it. It's true, yeah. It's only as he's starting to kill people within her life that she's seeing it in her waking life. And I think that's interesting. I like the setup of this movie. I just don't entirely think it fully pays off, that setup. No, because in the end, it basically comes down to them just having a really good connection, like really being in love, basically. And it doesn't really explain why that would be based on the backstory that he gives her about his traumatic childhood. Like... Because he's two people. Because the man that loved her was not the killer. Oh, right. And yeah. then when they're talking about it, when they first make love, I said make love. That's right. It's the 70s. Mm -hmm. So when they first make love, they're talking about it. And what they're talking about is about them falling in love, about them finding each other, about them being okay with being alone and then realizing when they actually meet that person, how wonderful but terrifying it is. But I think they were also talking about their psychic connection and their psychic connection is evil. Their main connection is the fact that they get really aroused after their friends get murdered. <laughs> you know what? It happens a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I did like there in that final segment that he does still genuinely love her and she does still genuinely love him. That's true. To the point where he needs her to take him out, essentially. Yeah, and despite some problems I had leading up to it, that final moment where she's on the phone making the 911 call is really heartbreaking. Absolutely. Really? Yeah, it's a really good scene. The whole is actually really good. I love the shot of him with the ice pick in the mirror, where it's the two versions yes. of himself. Yeah, that was really cool. I actually really enjoyed the scene where they go for the walk in the forest and when they first start making out or whatever. Normally, that's the part that I hate the mm. most because I find it usually very trite or it's very selfish. You know, like, yeah. yeah, like when people are trying to get together or whatever, or it's all lost. And the way they actually did it, <laughs> like talking out loud like they're in a play. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I don't know. I'm not sure. And this is silly. But the yeah. timing of it was perfect. They had really good chemistry. Yeah. yeah. And Kirshner had a great commentary on the DVD. He's a really fun old guy. He has that habit of talking really quiet. And then suddenly, by the way, uh-huh. just suddenly shouting. It's really cute. Guy. But but with scenes like that, he said he wanted to plant the camera and then he let the actors block out that scene by themselves. And with that whole scene where Tommy Lee Jones' character flips, where it's revealed that he's the killer, Tommy Lee Jones wrote that little monologue himself. Oh, good for Tommy Lee Jones. Because as I said, I did read a draft of the script that was pretty much the final script, and that exchange is a bit different. I really like what Jones, man, we don't see much early Jones. We know him as kind of the crustier older guy. Absolutely, yeah. The only thing I've seen of him really of earlier stuff was something with him in a park, like he's running around a park, like Central Park or something like that. Yeah, I can't remember what it was, but yeah, I remember it was like in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. He was a crazy bomber. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I know he did have some big parts here in the late 70s and early 80s, like Coal Miner's Daughter and whatnot. Oh, yes. He was great. And we're going to see him again in Black Moon Rising, another one that Carpenter wrote. Oh, nice. He made for an interesting leading man here, because he's kind of unconventional. With his unibrow? Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) It was the 70s. People had hair in odd places and didn't hide from it. It's true. I like it. I think it makes people look very interesting. And everyone had fantastic hair in this movie. (laughs) I was more intrigued by his bell-bottom jeans. Yes, that was also pretty cool. There was a lot of bell bottoms. I'm so around. into bell bottoms on men. Are you? Yeah, I know it's like a weirdo thing, but there's nothing worse than like men in skinny jeans. I find it almost repulsive. <laughs> I love a nice tailored pant on yeah. a man, but a bell bottom for some reason that kind of like breezy. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, he's got that kind of bow legged swagger that fits them really well. Yeah, you know, like slumped with the hands in the pocket. Yeah. You know, we're looking for clues. Yeah, the black turtleneck. <laughs> Yes. Black turtleneck and blazer. I don't think he's ever worn a turtleneck since because he had no neck. <laughs> <laughs> so I think whoever did costumes would probably needed to revisit that look, although a lot of men were wearing turtlenecks in that film, so I'm guessing it was popular at the time. I think the main reason I love this movie it is a character actor palooza. I was very oh, pleased. Yeah. Like, one of my favorites, of course, Brad Dourif. I'm like, oh, man, that's great. And he was amazing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We got Brad Dourif. We got Renée Bergenois. We got Raul Julia. I actually called them all, and I usually can never do that. I'm like, that's that, that's that. And this was when Raul Julia was still largely just a Broadway actor and had only just popped up in a few films here and there. He was fantastic, by the way. <laughs> this was long before the Of Course years. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Brad Dorf, he had already, I don't know if it was Oscar nominated or not, but he had the very popular role in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Oh, yeah. Yep. I always forget that, which is strange because it's such a popular role. But yeah, absolutely. And then Renee Abergenois did a lot of theater and TV at the time. But yeah, it's really good cast. I, I love the cast in this movie. It was excellent. Absolutely. Even the models like Lulu and Michelle, where they actually cast actual models, I thought they had good personality. They were convincing in their parts. Their patter was excellent. They were very natural. My only kind of sour note at times was Faye Dunaway. And I think part of that is just some of the dialogue they give her, as Julia pointed out in in that one scene in the park. It worked very well there, but some of the dialogue they give her is kind of hammy. And she doesn't have a very good scream to put her in the scream queen position. (laughs) This kind of predates that whole scream queen kind of thing. But no, I could understand that. We're just one year off. Yeah, that's true. Actually, I think. When was Halloween? I think that was the same year. Yeah, it must have been, actually. Like, I don't think it was 79. I know we're still two episodes away. Because we're doing uh, Zuma Beach next, right? Spoilers, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, spoiler alert. But yeah, that Isa Loramara Zuma Beach and Halloween and Someone's Watching Me were all in 1978. I had a banner year there. So our next three episodes are all still going to be in the same year. We will not leave the 70s for some time, folks. Does it feel like it took a really long time to go through that? You know how, like, there was a resurgence of a lot of films in the 70s. And, like, so obviously they just stood the test of time because they were of quality Mm. and, like, all that kind of stuff. I just feel like the 70s was a really long decade. (laughs) It does feel like that, yeah. It was a decade where it was going through so much experimentation that it went through so many different things all in a short span of time. Yeah, when you think of, like, I don't know, even the 80s where you're just like, neon! You know, like, it's yeah. like you have these sort of like a John Hughes idea and like action films and stuff. But the 70s itself was a, you know, a heck of an arc. It was, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, and you have to remember that R-rated films only became a thing in like, what, 1968, 1969? So suddenly they could do movies exploring sex and violence and pushing boundaries. And so you had a whole era of filmmakers all literally just saying, hey, here's something nobody else could have done till now. 
Mm -hmm, for sure. And then when you think about it, it's like in relation of how long ago that actually was. Because even Alex seems like, well, what was the touchtone phone on her desk at yes. the very beginning? And you thought it was a computer, like just on the corner of your office. <laughs> It was, the, yeah. it was her, like, for her slides. Yeah. That was a computer. It just oh, looked like thing. she was going towards yeah. a giant MacBook, basically. Yeah, because yeah, you're just sort of used to seeing it. Yeah. But then when you actually think about it, like, that was 40 years ago. Yeah. Like, if you think in relation, like, if it was the 70s, that would have meant the time between that and the 30s. Yeah. <laughs> if someone called you, there was no way of finding out who that was. <laughs> this film came into existence four years before I came into existence. I was not born yet either, but not by much. We'll just leave it at that. I'm 34. <laughs> <laughs> but just like, just, just the weight of it, of yeah. how much has happened since then. It's oh, just yeah. kind of amazing that it's like, and even New York was so different. I don't even know if it's strangely, but I found it very beautiful. It was dirty as hell. Yeah. <laughs> And it was all fire escapes and old brickwork and dark and alleys and all that kind of stuff. And it's like when you sort of see New York stuff now, it's not like that at all. No, I think it's like that until like the mid 80s. Yeah, well, there was this big push, I want to say early 90s, where they went through and just like did a whole bunch of city programs that cleaned up the city. That was when they cleaned up Times Square, right? Yeah, there was some mayor yeah. that went like nuts and but like uh, just started cleaning up everything. I can't remember when that was specifically, mainly because I'm not a New Yorker. But yeah, it was a marked definition anything before he was here it's like this film it's kind of dirty it's kind of bohemian it's trashy but in a kind of livable way or it has its parts it has parts that are horrible and parts that are kind of charming and then ever since then it's just kind of been a clean crisp city yeah for sure Starbucksified. Yeah, I mean, like you have that one great scene where she's getting the cab ride and the cabbie gets stuck in a street. It's a one way street with cars parked on either side and you can't drive down it. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, I just liked her walking down the street and just trash. Yeah. Trash everywhere. Yeah. All around, in the streets, piling over bins. Recycling doesn't exist, which is silly because it hasn't existed for that long. Well, I know there was also a period where there was like a series of garbage strikes. Yeah, that's true. I was always terrified of New York because of movies, basically. It was always <laughs> trash cans on fire and like giant turtles coming out of sewers and whatnot. <laughs> Robert De Niro driving a cab. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just like the idea of thinking about how far away it is. Even when like they do the scene, her art show, which is basically a club. I've never seen an art show like that. Every art show I see is in a square white room where everyone's bored and drinking free wine. But this was like yeah. a club. There was disco lights and music. Everything hanging against black velvet. It was it was really neat. Mm -hmm. It looked like a good party. It did, absolutely. But even like the extras there, where I've seen some extras who look like they're in their maybe like late 50s. 50s, early 60s. I'm like, those people are dead. Yeah. That was like 34 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Some of them probably died within that year. Most likely. Yeah. <laughs> people that were in their 20s, the young girls and stuff, are like in their 60s. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the things this film does really well is capturing that time and that environment. And yeah, it was filmed on location in New York, makes beautiful use of the city. Even just that great warehouse that she does her shoot in. I would like to look. Yeah. Great, huge, empty warehouse with those windows overlooking the docks. That looked amazing. I would love to live there. Oh, it's a magnificent location. Mm -hmm. Even just the use of the fashion industry. I mean, just the way that the models get in their hair and makeup, Laura's setting up shots, going over everything. It has a very authentic feel to it, and I really like it. Yeah, I could imagine it being like that. Absolutely. It was. It was actually, because even like the small experience that I have with being on sets where there's makeup trailers and all that kind of stuff, it was on mark. Mm. But it was also kind of neat because she was a photographer in the 70s. Everything was tactile because mm -hmm. everything was yeah. actually a film. Yeah. yeah. So it was weird to see all the accoutrement and the stuff and like yeah. thinking that it has to be printed on paper and like all that kind of stuff. You got to jazz it up. <laughs> but it was also kind of cool too that you touch everything. Yeah. Like there's even a great bit where she has to go and take Polaroid shots just to make sure everything's set up fine. And then her assistant hands her the good camera. Yeah. Which seemed like not a very elaborate camera. That seemed like <laughs> a very... I was not impressed with her camera. I thought there should be like a big lens on it or something. That seemed like a very, like a Nikon. <laughs> and a lot of the people here were from the industry. As I said, a lot of the models were models. All the hair and makeup people were actual hair and makeup people. Rebecca Blake, who did a lot of the photography, she was on set. She was consulting. She had taken Faye Dunaway out on a number of shoots. So, I mean, they actually brought in people just to make it authentic. And I thought it captured that industry really. I mean, even just that great photo shoot on the street where all the people are looking on like what the hell is this mm -hmm. and the models you always think of models posing but you don't always think of models having to just repeat the same movement over and over again which was hilarious the one model just opening and closing yeah. her coat over. it has a twisted it's a small world type of thing to it you know? 
Absolutely, yeah. I think what we're talking about, though, it's not something you see as often these days. You see a lot of milling about in movies these days. Back in, like, the 70s and 80s, there was a lot of people, like, you don't see people talking over each other as much in movies as often these days. I think that's why I really like the film Super 8, because that's, like, the way people actually talk, is everyone's trying to get a word in and no one's actually listening to each other. It was nice. It had a lot of atmosphere to it. And I credit a lot of that to Julian Barry, who was a very big playwright at the time. You know, the thing is, reading the script of this movie, it really didn't work very well on paper. It was kind of flat. It was very dialogue heavy. But you see it in motion with the actors, the way all the things are set up. It really comes alive. Mm -hmm, I can see that. It's one of those scripts. It just it doesn't read well on paper. So it's kind of hard to judge. It has a very naturalistic feel. And one of the things about, about Irvin Kirshner is I went into this thinking that he's pretty much a for hire guy. You just bring him in on a project. He'll knock it out. But, you know, listening to the commentary, just even comparing that draft to what's on the final screen, he puts a lot of thought into every single shot, into every single delivery. It's a very meticulously well put together film. Absolutely. Even if someone's brought in as a work for hire, there's no reason they can't be like a very meticulous person or put a lot of TLC into it. So that's great to hear. Who was the cinematographer, Noel? Uh, the cinematographer was Victor J. Kemper, who the reason I didn't put him in the list was, you know, he's been around for a while. Nowadays, he just does the bring it on direct to video sequels and some of the American Pie sequels. Amazing. Nice. I just want to make sure that like, he was still alive so that he could come and light me because the way he bounced light off Faye Dunaway's face was amazing. <laughs> yeah. She looked like an angel. She was like the way women used to look in like the black and white films in the 40s and 50s where they just kind of lean forward a little bit and open their mouth yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it just bounced right off their cheekbones. <laughs> I think it would help if I had Faye Dunaway's cheekbones. She looked a little like Meryl Streep to me, like a young she Meryl Streep. A little Streep. Meryl Streep. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, you say young Meryl Streep, but Meryl Streep was only just a couple of years away from really being a star in her own right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I guess it would be, yeah. It was like the early 80s, wasn't it, for her? Yeah. It's a really pretty movie, and it's very nicely put together. I said the editing is great. There was so much that was cut, though. I mean, what's interesting is realizing how bloated that script was that I read by seeing how tight and trim the movie is, because there was a lot of just extraneous people chattering, talking about this, talking about that. Some of the things that are worth pointing out are like the abusive boyfriend of one of the models. He was the one at the funeral who was says, we all blame you, Laura. We all blame you. He was a much bigger part in the script being built as a suspect. You actually see him hit his girlfriend, Michelle, around a few times. I think he got a little buried in the background. But otherwise, most of what was cut, there would be entire conversations, which in the film are just like one line. Like the scene where Tommy, the limo driver, buys a flower for Lulu and she says, oh, a stolen flower. It went on for like a page and a half of this entire conversation of basically just her gradually shooting him down. And it didn't need it. What was great about seeing the finished film is Irvin Kirshner was great at just pulling out the essential moments. Mm hmm. Because that's how the shoot down would actually go. Like that scene was perfect the way it was. Like yeah. it would actually just peter out instead of be a, like a whole thing. So, yeah. Because if we think about Assault on Precinct 13, which we did last month, Carpenter is very tight. Yeah. And what I got the impression from reading that script was it was basically just someone essentially pulling a Stan Lee. Of, <laughs> Let's just mm. take this very simple story and fill it with words. Yeah. The story was still there, but it kind of became buried under the clutter. And what Kirshner did was he kind of stripped it back down. Now, what's sad, though, is I can't find Carpenter's original draft. I can't even find any info on it. From what I hear, the story is essentially the same and some of the details are a little different. Kirshner on the commentary says he wasn't very happy with Carpenter's script and he wanted to make it more of a romantic tragedy than a straight thriller. So I'm assuming it's not so much that stuff was changed as the focus of stuff was changed. As you know, more emphasis was put on the kind of psychological aspects, more was put on the romance and all that. Mm -hmm. So I would love to see his original script just because I know it was kind of his love letter to Giallo movies and I'd just be curious to see what he did with it. Sadly, I can't find it. The final film, as I said, one of the main problems is it tries to make this big commentary on how violence is used in the media, mm -hmm. but it never ultimately follows it, a lot of buildup on it in the first half of the movie, and then it never really goes anywhere. 
Yeah, uh, I could see that. It was hard for me to pick up on that because time has gone past, so they were very tame, and we are in a United Colors of Benetton kind of world now, so that's not very shocking anymore, just like a, a murder yeah. scene with some boobies. And even the kills are pretty much TV movie level in oh, terms yeah. of violence. And he said on the commentary he wasn't interested in focusing on the violence, but the themes of the movie are focusing on the violence. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. And this is the director who then went and did Robocop 2, which was one of the most violent movies in the late that 80s. That would be as a child. <laughs> this is where it's a good film, but it's still kind of a frustrating film. Yeah, I could see that if you look at the stylistic elements. I was satisfied, I would say, though, overall. Overall, yeah. I mean, I did enjoy it, and it is a film I would recommend. It's just, it has certain caveats. Mm -hmm. I think it's a film that will entertain. It's just, it's a film that has problems, but it's still watchable in spite of them. I think I was just very pleasantly surprised. So I was just like, oh, thank oh, you. As was I, yeah. Because yeah. I had never seen this one before either. Was Faye Dunaway's photographs, because she was very, very popular because of what she had done with her, well, murder scenes to sell deodorant, essentially. Mm. Was she doing that kind of stuff before she hit big with that type of thing? Because I think it was more about, with this psychic connection that she had with Tommy Lee Jones, her rise to stardom was him. He did it. Yeah, this specific line of photos in, the, in that one scene where he's showing her the crime scene photographs that mirror her photos, was he says, you know, this started 14 months ago, and she says, the timing is interesting, because that's right around the time I was inspired to start this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for, from all indications, that's when he first killed, that mm -hmm. he hadn't killed before that. There was also a scene in the script where there was the whole story of he was a kind of an abandoned boy who was left alone by his kind of abusive prostitute mother. There was a scene in the script where when he's talking to her in her apartment, I think for the first time, she has a photo of kind of a lonely, forlorn boy, and she talks about how yeah, that was just an image that's always been stuck in her head, and she gives him the photograph to keep. And I just thought that was kind of a nice telling moment that these two have kind of been bonded for a long time, mm -hmm. but always with a long distance between them, and this is only them finally coming together. Again, it's a very interesting thing, but it's almost so slight that it doesn't entirely sell, but it's still good. I just think the fact that we liked him so much, he was such a likable, I know it's a lot of it's Tommy Lee Jones, that's what made it more of a tragedy to me. I didn't want it to be him, because a lot of horror movies, you don't really care about the characters, so when they die, it's kind of not really a big deal, and I'm always like, you should care about the characters more. And then uh, as I got older, I'm like, I kind of don't want to care about the characters more, because it's really upsetting when they get killed. <laughs> the first two victims were just two older women that we never really got to know, mm -hmm. but then we have Lulu and Michelle, who are just kind of an interesting little group of characters. And then there's the René Abergenois character who is just so lovable. It's true. He's very nice. And I liked his... Uh... Oh, really? Because I thought he had a mean streak. I didn't like him at all. No? No. One of the things is they were trying to build him as a suspect too. No, I didn't like him. No? Okay. With the argument that he had with the taxi driver, the fact that he even hired the taxi driver to begin with, which is not right, the driver <laughs> itself, not the taxi driver, yeah. sorry, that has already robbed a bank with a weapon. He's very catty. No, I didn't like him. Two pro Odo, one against. I'm pro Odo. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> well, I will say this, and Kirshner did cover this in the commentary was, and I didn't even pick up on this until Kirshner was talking about the commentary was, that whole story of he hired him, even though he knew his past and certain looks that he would give, was he was being built as a suspect too, was maybe he was using the limo driver as a tool to kill people. He was my number one suspect until the two girls got killed. Who, Rene Abergenois or Tommy? Uh, Rene was my first uh, oh, really? choice, and I switched it over to Tommy. I okay. just thought because... Um, Tommy was the obvious suspect. <laughs> Yeah, he was too obvious. Yeah, he's too obvious. Well, like Tommy Lee Jones, were you saying, was the obvious suspect or Brad Dorff's character? Brad Dorff's character of Tommy. Yeah, he was too obvious to me. <laughs> I'm just like, I can't be him. I'll be honest, when I was first reading this, because I do typically read the script before I watch the movie, because it came first, I kind of figured out by page 30 that it was the Tommy Lee Jones character. <laughs> Did you? Yeah. And one of the things is that Kirshner said he specifically wanted to build the film so that you could watch it a second time knowing that he's the killer and you suddenly see all of these things in him, like certain little ways he delivers lines, certain ways he looks and all stuff that makes it a character study of this killer who doesn't want to be a killer. I mean, like there's even that great bit where the Brad Dorff character is killed and he just starts yelling at the other cop of he was sick, man. He was sick. You know, he's talking about himself there. Yeah, I could see that, absolutely. Did you see him jump over that gate? Tommy Lee Jones was a machine in this movie. Oh, yeah, they were about to call cut and have a stuntman come in, and he hopped right over it. Yeah, that was uh, <laughs> almost frightening. He's just like, nope, I'm just going right over it. <laughs> yeah, the other cop was an interesting kind of little background character. He was. He was very much kind of a typical jerk cop, but yeah. uh, I liked him at the same time. I found with police officers in movies, I think 
I'm sure there must have been a shift in real life, but definitely in movies where they weren't the enemy, Mm -hmm. especially in the 70s. Like, they were mean as hell, always trying to get you, never helping out. And there was this kind of shift sort of like in the 80s and now where it's like, of course, there's bent cop movies and all that kind of stuff, but Mm. they're not seen as these like hard, angry, smoking men (laughs) so much anymore. What was the cop movie in the 70s with Gene Hackman and... French Connection? French Connection was where your lead character, the cop, is probably the worst person in the movie. Yeah. It's true, yeah. I think only like Serpico did someone come off looking good. <laughs> yeah, and of course this was the area of Dirty Harry and stuff like that. Absolutely, yeah. yeah fascist police officer. And then it led up into the 80s super cop. Yes. To take care of everybody. <laughs> the Cobra-esque cop. <laughs> <laughs> the cop who fights any Jay Walker with a bazooka. It's definitely a film that really captures the time very well. One of the other interesting scenes that was cut was there's a couple of times in the film that you see a little person. Yeah. His character name was Billy T. And the reason why he was around was he actually did pose in a number of photographs. And there was one scene where he kind of threw a crazed fit and broke into a store window and went up to a display of the Eyes of Laura Mars book and was tearing out the pictures that feature him because he's like, they're killing everyone else who's in here. I can't be in here. I can't be in here. Oh, that would have been cool. That would have been cool. With the themes of violence that are kind of set up in the beginning, the violence in the media, and then there's that scene, it's kind of an interesting precursor to some similar stuff we'll be seeing a little further down the road when Carpenter does the film In the Mouth of Madness. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. What's that about? Oh, you'll see in the 90s. Have either of you seen it? Of course, I love that movie. Love it. So you probably I, know what I'm talking about in terms of some of the similarity in the setup. Yeah, absolutely. Is that? The, I always thought that it was about... Uh... Sam Neill goes to a <laughs> village that... Um, it's he's... Sam Neill, there's a horror author, people are going crazy. Yeah. We'll, we'll, see, we'll leave we'll... it at that until we get there. <laughs> yeah, I haven't yeah. seen it a long time, so I'll be going in fresh. I always thought, well, not recently, I figured it out a while ago, but when I was younger, and I always thought it was the documentary about Apocalypse Now. I thought that that's what it was Narcy, in the heart of darkness yeah. and in the mouth of madness. I got them confused, and I'm like, "Wow, people are really into this documentary." About <laughs> it was before the internet. Okay, I had to watch it for media class. <laughs> I actually think more people are into that documentary than were into the Carpenter film to this day. I would think so as well. Yeah, <laughs> to this day, that's heralded as a classic. The Carpenter film should be, but it's not. <laughs> it's an unsung classic. It's a classic in our hearts. But yeah, I think that's about all that I have to say about the movie. Anything else you guys wanted to bring up? The chase scene between Brad Dourif and Tommy Lee Jones, aside from yes. the thing over the fence, was excellent. Oh, that was great. Yeah, a lot of great handheld cameras sweeping around the New York streets. Yep. <laughs> I could see that Brad Dourif was running as fast as he physically possibly could. Yep, it looked Sometimes, real. Sometimes like, people are like trying to run cool. Yeah. You know, like everyone wants to beat Tom Cruise. <laughs> but this guy, he was just going for it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't really have too much else to say. I thought it was like a neat little thriller. It ties together nicely at the end. The kills, of course, were pretty blasé, but I mean, I guess they didn't really have the format down by that point. One thing I'd like to ask, since we're talking about like Giallo Giallo films, Mm -hmm. when is Black Christmas? When is that around? Black Christmas was 74. 74, wow. And in fact, we're going to get into that with Halloween because there actually were people from that involved in Halloween. All right, we'll put a pin in that one and leave that for that episode then. Black Christmas was kind of a response to the Gala films. I mean, the Gala films in Italy were primarily from 1970 to 1974. But in America, when they started coming over in the mid-70s, Brian De Palma was a huge Gallo fan, too. And you can see that in films like Blow Up, Dressed to Kill especially, Body Double, are very much like American Gallo movies. So basically, I haven't seen any Gallo films, but I've seen all the ones that they were inspired by. I would even say, like, they became popular in Japan in the 90s when a lot of them finally were able to be released in the 90s. And we see stuff like Perfect Blue come out, which is kind of like a response to the Gallo movement. I have actually seen that, and you are absolutely... Absolutely correct. (laughs) It's a very similar plot, too, isn't it? Like an actress, right? Yeah, I mean, Giallo plots are very much your typical kind of Hitchcockian thriller, but really what defines the Giallo movies are just the style and the fashion and the atmosphere and the lighting, the focus on the kills. Especially the Dario Argento movies where he would himself play the hands of the killer. Oh, would he? Which got a little creepy in the movies involving his daughter as a victim. I've heard about that, yes. Yeah. Uh, topless in some of his movies, which is... Oh, he plays the killer raping his daughter. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, the Argentos have a complicated relationship. It sounds like it, yeah. (laughs) 
and hopefully I won't need to bring him up again. But yeah, what's interesting is, you know, a lot of people focus on Halloween for that opening sequence where it's that entire opening scene done in one camera shot from the point of view of the killer. Yeah. Whereas, you know, Eyes of Laura Mars was doing that stuff in the same year, which mm-hmm. Carpenter apparently did script it that way. And the script was written, I want to say, around 74, 75. And Dario Argento was doing that back in 1971, 1972. Cat of Nine Tales. Every single kill is done from the point of view of the killer. I gotta say this, it might be controversial. Not a big fan of that. Not a big fan of the point of view killings. <laughs> it depends on how it's done. I'm not a fan of it in this movie because I just thought they were a little dull and they were very simple. The Halloween one that we'll get to is much more of a complex scene. The Argento ones are much more complex. Like you have like the killer from the killer point of view having to scale a fence. You have really elaborate stuff, like from the killer point of view, stalking someone on sand, realizing they're on sand, then hopping up onto stones and just going from stone to stone. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. To hide the footsteps. Absolutely. Cat and Nine Tales, I highly recommend. It's just, it's a very good movie, even though Argento himself doesn't agree with me. <laughs> well, we can agree to disagree with Dario. It's probably the only Argento movie I'm going to highly recommend. <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. And I have more stuff to say on the Halloween one, but we'll leave that as well. Yeah. Julia, you were saying a bit ago about Tarantino? Oh, I saw an interview with him. I think it was on Rand Norton where he was talking about Inglorious Bastards and okay. about the scene where, I don't know the actress's name, but the blonde lady gets strangled by that fellow that you really like. Christoph Waltz. Watch me leave the tail. So yeah. <laughs> she gets strangled by it, but Quentin Tarantino did it. He was the hands that was strangling her because he wanted to get the right reaction from her face. Mm -hmm. So he basically almost killed her. (laughs) (laughs) And it was just kind of like, so you trust me? And she's like, yeah. And so they filmed it, and he choked her until she almost passed out, and then he let go. You know, actors can act. (laughs) You don't need to actually do these things. (laughs) I think he wanted wanted the red in the face and the eyes bulging, and he wanted to see the panic. Yeah, it was was a frightening scene. And it was even better because he told the story like, that's a long time I choked this woman. Like, this funny little tale. Yeah, that's Tarantino. Yeah, he's kind of a creepazoid. I like that he's creepy. Yeah. (laughs) I don't necessarily want to be his friend. (laughs) But, you know, keeping it interesting. He gets results. I like that he's in the industry. I don't want to hang out with him. Yeah, well, it's like a lot of people I admire. I don't want that man anywhere near my feet. Yeah. <laughs> Depends how much he's paying. I mean, really? You're going to start reassessing your goals. That's true, yeah. <laughs> if he can buy me a house, mm, I'll definitely maybe he can do whatever he likes to my tootsies. <laughs> So yeah, Eyes of Laura Mars, I think, you know, despite a few reservations, we all still recommend it. We all still recommend it, yep. I have no reservations, I recommend it. Oh uh, yeah, you know, I'll recommend it without reservations. I just don't think it's a great movie, but it is still a very good one. I'm pro Eyes of Laura Mars, yes. This whole podcast is paying off. We're seeing some pretty good films that I wouldn't actually watch without it, so yeah. Yeah, but that was the interesting thing, is I asked the internet, so what do you think of Eyes of Laura Mars? And I got zero response. I never heard of it. <laughs> never heard of it. <laughs> I'm surprised that the DVD even has special features because it is that obscure of a film these days. Special features? Like, what is there, a trailer? <laughs> yeah, trailer, interactive menu. They got a commentary and then there's actually a little featurette. It's called a photo gallery, but it actually has a little bit of narration from one of the DVD producers talking about an early draft of the script and stuff that was cut from it. But sadly, he doesn't have Carpenter's draft of the script either. He was just reading off the same one I had. Oh, fair enough. I do also want to say, though, that I did also read the novelization by H.B. Gilmore, who wrote a number of novelizations throughout the 70s and 80s. It's very good, and I highly recommend it. It's pretty much the draft of the script that I read. So, I mean, it has all those cut scenes, but it's otherwise not that different. And Gilmore actually was invited by the director to hang out on set. So she got to see how a lot of the scenes were shot. She got to talk to the actors about their characters. So she incorporates a lot of this great material into the book and really fleshes it out well. And her writing style is very nice. If you're a fan of the movie Eyes of Laura Mars, I do recommend checking out the novelization. All right. There you go. Otherwise, I have nothing else to add. And up next, Zuma Beach. Zuma Beach, another one. And don't tell me because I want to go in fresh again because that was really fun. I don't know what I'm in store for. I will say this. Suzanne Summers. Ooh! <laughs> I love me some young Suzanne Summers. There you go. Yeah, I mean, this one is probably the most obscure of all the Carpenter ones we'll find. Actually, there's not any production history to talk about, so I won't have anything to say. He worked on it as a writer, but he was not the writer. Okay. Yeah. And it was a TV movie and only just recently came on it. It never released on video. 
It never really was pirated online. Nobody had seen this movie until for some reason Warner was like, sure, we'll stick it on a disc. (laughs) (laughs) And we're glad they did. So I hope you two are able to find a copy. (laughs) Because I have it in my head where I try to structure it in my head, but it never goes that way where I'm like, I'm going to talk about this, this, and this, and this order. And then I'm just like, I love Black Christmas. (laughs) Yeah. My notes are so point form because I'm like, I'll remember this. And I don't remember this one note just says decanters of scotch. Oh, because you really like because no one has them anymore where they would have a sidebar with decanters, yeah. the crystal decanters of scotch in them. And you're like, scotch is in there? I'm like, probably. It's usually <laughs> just to give someone something to do. It's like a Well, because they drank all the time. Too. That's true. All the time. Yeah. <laughs> they were drinking at work. <laughs> they were drinking at home. They were drinking just to have a drink. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we barely actually talked about Raul Julia's character who was drinking everywhere. <laughs> I wanted to talk more about him. I wanted he was to talk. Wonderful, yeah. He was so good looking. Like I knew he was a handsome Gomez, but like I didn't kind of like make it in my mind. And I yeah. was like, damn girl. He's smooth too. <laughs> yeah. Even though he was a scumbag. Yeah. <laughs> super smooth. <laughs> I would totally let him take some money after he came back to my house and we did more. <laughs> Rest in peace and bison. Mm, do it. I did like the moments there where he was standing on the pier across with them, just glaring at him. <laughs> yeah. There was a point there where he looked exactly like what Lucas Haas looks like now. I yeah, was thinking I see that, actually. maybe yeah. if Lucas Haas and Benicio Del Toro had a son. Yes. It could be Raul Julia. Maybe shrink the ears a little bit. Well, <laughs> I think more Benicio's, like, the intensity. Yes. Yeah. He's kind of got that, like, bloodshot, like, very intense stare. Yeah. Like, yeah. He was a little drunk rapey, though. He's a little oh, drunk yeah. Rapey. yeah. Yeah, well, the character was awful, I think but that was the act itself was great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that was stuff that actually wasn't in the script, was especially when he was climbing all over Laura. Yeah. If it's the character. It but, does. Uh, yeah. Where he's so drunk, he doesn't realize that his awfulness is that awful. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're waking up in laundromats. <laughs> yeah. Like that. Though, you know, that actually wasn't him. What do you mean that wasn't him? That was Neville calling, pretending to be him. Really? Oh. Because he was muttering all drunk. In the script, they actually show it more clearly. But yeah, that wasn't him calling. Oh. That was Neville trying to get her out of the apartment so he could go kill Donald. Because uh, I totally would have just been like, I would call the cab to go pick him up and bring him to me. Yeah, especially like, especially with a murderer on the loose. She was not concerned enough for being targeted by a murderer. I'm sorry. I would have taken a lot of precaution. I would have checked around corners. I would have had the police outside my door. I would not try to sneak away from the police. Yeah, she was only trying to make it so that they didn't think that Ralph Julia was a suspect, which I totally understand. But therefore, send your driver. <laughs> you know, like get him to go pick him up and bring him to you. There was also that scene with Rene Bergenois where he dresses up as her to distract the police it's my birthday i can do whatever i want what i liked about that scene though was you know most movies would just end it on that joke yeah this one it held for a little moment and it just kind of showed that this guy's kind of sad he just blew his birthday party to help her run away and now he's dressed like this and he's just kind of stumbling back angry and upset i like that he freaked out and like yeah. swing at them and they kind of drove off away from it he's a really good actor and he could actually pull that i will off. not be called any more names yeah it could have easily just been as you were saying like just a drag joke basically yeah. Yeah. No, it was really good. The homosexuality of the character, I mean, I think the only major references there was that. There was maybe one line in the party, and then there was that bit where the cop was kind of winking at him and making a joke. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, the whole I can do a Lloyd Bridges was just something that he did because he can do. I was going to bring that up, and it was a good Lloyd Bridges impersonation. (laughs) (laughs) He was correct. (laughs) In the script, it was much more. He actually had a boyfriend who was a character in the story. Tommy was angry because Donald kept making him drive out to the gay bars and all that stuff. His birthday was actually even more natural than the um, shoot scenes, like of the models and stuff like that. His birthday felt very, oh, like, yeah. it was yeah. good, yeah. I love the photograph that she took. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. I hate it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> For a film made in the 70s, you didn't see very many portrayals of a gay character that was... They would always put more of a spotlight on it, take more jokes at it. Here's just, he's gay. Let's move on. And he yeah. just was. He just was gay. I love the one guy who's just like, don't set your wig on fire. Yeah, he's, like... <laughs> he's kind of like, when he's laying out of the candles. <laughs> and with like models and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of homosexuals in that field. There would be, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It should be realistic. They should be there. Absolutely. Yeah. And it shouldn't be a big deal. And it shouldn't be like joking. Exactly. No. Yeah. I mean, even the script played it up that he dresses in drag a lot because he is gay. And in the film, it's more, no, he's just doing that because the moment needed it and he doesn't enjoy it. It's more complicated and that's realistic. And I like it. Yeah, absolutely. It's mature. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. So I think I'm just going to take these last few minutes and just edit them back into the episode. (laughs) Sounds good. Uh, Yeah, because we're on fire. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, as soon as we relax. It took us a few minutes to get to this. So what else did we want to talk about? (laughs) 
one more thing I loved mm-hmm. the eulogy for the models. That was really nice and like a nice touch yeah. that they went and properly you Googleized them. You Googleized that's right. <laughs> you know, if you listen to it, he's actually kind of knocking their profession as models, the priest. No, uh, I don't think so. He said the definition of what a model was. And then at the end, he said, but it's also someone to be admired yes. and like people follow in the footsteps. So I like that touch yeah. as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, because he intended that one as a criticism. Did he really? They're using these people to admire and follow in the footsteps of? Well, oh. then he needs to work on his sarcasm tone. Yeah. Because it's not very good. There was actually a cut line in the funeral where one person leaned over to another and says, that bastard. Oh, really? But yeah, I mean, I love the funeral scene of it's just that going on in the background while Neville's standing in the door, Laura locks eyes with him, Donald locks eyes with him, Tommy locks eyes with him. There's just great tension. And they were together because they were lovers, right? I they lived know. together in the same house. They were giving each other naked massages. Well, what it was with the models is one of them was gay. One of them is bi. Okay. Huh. Lulu is supposed to be gay. Michelle is bi. She's in relationships with both Lulu and her boyfriend. That's one of the reasons why her boyfriend keeps hitting her. Yeah, right, 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 right. But they should have stayed together instead of being the boyfriend because they made great answering machine messages. It's true. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, they were kind of an open couple. Okay. But then I love after those locked looks, yeah, that walk down the hallway, the doors open, and then they're swarmed with reporters. Mm-hmm. Irving Kirshner really does build a scene very nicely. Mm-hmm. And then having that guy come and attack her. Mm-hmm. Well, not physically, but with his words about uh, accusing her of being the one who's at fault. I, that was totally out of left field for me. I didn't think that was going to happen. Mm-hmm. And it's just between this and seeing his work on Empire Strikes Back and the couple of other movies I've seen, I've long thought that Kirshner was pretty much just your typical for hire director, but I'm just really impressed with the attention to detail. And so I'm curious to now look into more of his movies. I am actually as well. And I, as an Empire Strikes Back fan, think I'm finding out who made it because basically it's synonymous with George Lucas, even though he did not direct the two films that I really love. Might not go watch Robocop 2 again, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know if I could do RoboCop 2 again. It was his last film. Yeah, it's got a <laughs> Miller stink to it as well. <laughs> Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Masters of Carpentry is a Made of Fail production. Madeoffail.net. We were unpopular before it was cool. Okay, that, I can't talk and I'm realizing my the stuff that I did type is full. Like, I typed Dario Arjunto. <laughs> His evil twin brother. <laughs> <laughs>